Friday the 13th. You could ask yourself a question. Do I feel lucky? If you don't, you could be suffering from triskaidekaphobia. That's a fear of the number 13. Napoleon, Herbert Hoover, and FDR are well-documented triskaidekaphobics. But why do folks think 13 is unlucky, particularly when it falls on a Friday, as it will three times this year? The University of Delaware's Thomas Fernsler is known as Dr. 13. He's an expert on the number's bad reputation, which may date back to biblical times. After all, the 13th guest at the Last Supper was Judas. And you know how that worked out for Jesus, who was crucified on a Friday. Other factoids from Fernsler, the first person to die in a car accident was killed in New York City on September the 13th in 1899, although that was a Wednesday. And the ill-fated flight of Apollo the 13th launched at the 13th minute of the 13th hour, Central Standard Time, on April 11th, 1970. And the numerals in the date 41170 add up to, gasp, 13, as long as you don't include the 19 in 1970. Hey, sometimes superstition can be hard work. Today, some tall buildings lack a 13th floor. Well, they have a 13th floor, but they call it the 14th floor, because the purveyors of bad luck are apparently easily fooled. Meanwhile, over in France, panicky Parisian party throwers can even hire a quatorzième, a professional 14th guest. Like Judas, Mark Twain was allegedly once poised to be the 13th guest at a dinner party. A superstitious friend warned the very rational Twain not to go. But Twain went. It was bad luck, he later remarked. They only had food for 12. wanted to turn down the volume at a deafening concert or noisy bar? Envy the whale. A new study finds that toothed whales can reduce their own auditory sensitivity when they expect a loud sound. The work is presented at this week's Acoustics 2012 meeting. Whales and dolphins rely on their responsive hearing to interpret returning echolocation clicks. Previous research suggested that these marine mammals could dull their hearing before uttering outgoing echolocation clicks, which are very loud. Could they use the same coping mechanism for external noises? To find out, researchers trained a false killer whale that a loud noise would always follow a brief warning signal. Then, they attached suction cup sensors to the outside of the whale's head and played the signal. The sensors measured brain waves that indicated the whale did reduce its hearing sensitivity in expectation of a clamor. The researchers hoped to test other species as well. Loud noises from ships can disturb whales. To accommodate marine life, perhaps vessels could emit signals before making a ruckus, warning whales to tune up. where they endure months of perpetual darkness. So they have to use sound rather than sight in order to find their way around. That's Aaron Mooney, a marine biologist at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in Massachusetts. He says belugas have really fast hearing, too. Sound underwater travels five times faster than it does in air, and so those guys have to basically perceive and utilize sound five times faster than, than we do. He and his colleagues traveled to Bristol Bay, Alaska, to test belugas hearing in the wild. They captured seven belugas for routine physicals and played them a series of frequencies while measuring the whale's brain activity with electrodes. 
Turns out the whale's hearing was sharp, and similar to that of captive belugas, which means they could appreciate sound ranging from about 4 kilohertz to 150, a frequency nearly eight times higher than the upper limit of our ears. The results are in the Journal of Experimental Biology. The older belugas tested in this survey still had decent hearing, too, but that might not be the case for belugas living in noisier Cook Inlet near Anchorage. There's a lot of uh, military activities, a lot of commercial activities in Cook Inlet, and those animals are known to be declining at a, at a rate of about 2% per year, and we think noise is a, is a major stressor to those animals. And now that researchers know what wild belugas should be able to hear, they can test Cook Inlet belugas to see whether that underwater noise is literally deafening. Height is correlated with a lot of things. Up to a certain height, taller people make more money than the vertically challenged, and the taller presidential candidate almost always wins. Now a study finds that your height as an adult has a profound effect on your perception of your health. Short people judge their health to be worse than average or tall people judge theirs. The research was published in the journal Clinical Endocrinology. Data for the study came from the 2003 Health Survey for England. More than 14,000 participants filled out questionnaires and had their heights measured. The study only looked at how good the subject thought his or her health was, not their actual health. Questions focused on five areas, mobility, self-care, normal activities, pain or discomfort, and anxiety or depression. Men shorter than about five foot four and women shorter than five feet reported the worst impressions, but small increases in height at the low end had much bigger effects on perception than the same increases among taller people. Other studies have shown, ironically, that shorter people on average actually live longer. Spread death of honeybees has some farmers fretting, because if honeybees disappear, who will pollinate their crops? Almost any kind of insect you can think of. Margie Mayfield, an ecologist at the University of Queensland in Australia. Globally speaking, flies are probably the second largest group of crop pollinators, um, in particular a group called hoverflies or surfid flies. And these are these sort of large-eyed flies that if you take a hike, you sometimes see them hovering in front of your face. Along with hoverflies, the army of underappreciated pollinators includes butterflies, moths, beetles, ants, and wasps. Mayfield and her colleagues analyzed more than three dozen studies on pollination, covering 17 crop plants grown on five continents. 
and they found that some of these underdog insects accounted for some 40% of the flower visits. And some of the crops in their review, especially tropical ones like mangoes and custard apples, did not rely on honeybees at all. Even commodities like canola did fine without the bees. The meta-analysis is in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Mayfield says part of the difficulty in gauging the importance of bees starts with the research methods. A third of the studies they initially considered, for example, ignored everything but bees. You know, the European honeybee is obviously from Europe, so <laughs> it's, uh, there's a lot of focus on the European honeybee there. Another issue, she says, is just raising awareness among farmers. I've encountered farmers in California and in South Africa and in Australia who, who spray um, their pesticides largely at night because that's when the bees have gone back to their hives. Um, and they do that with the idea that we'll spare our pollinators and we'll be able to control our pests. Um, but that very much takes the, the assumption that only bees are important pollinators. Of course, we should still do our best to save honeybees, the celebrity pollinators. But agricultural practices should consider the rest of these tiny farm workers, too. They're called button cells, coin cells or watch batteries. By any name, these tiny, round batteries pose a choking danger to small kids. And if a child succeeds in swallowing a button cell, the battery may short-circuit in the moist esophageal environment, burning the tissue. A few thousand kids wind up in emergency rooms each year after swallowing a button battery. But a team of Harvard and MIT researchers that includes prolific inventor Robert Langer thinks they have a partial solution, a protective coating. The scientists covered batteries with a material, technically a quantum tunneling composite, in which microparticles of conductive metal are suspended in an insulating layer. Under most circumstances, including inside of a child, the layer is nonconductive. But when the material is subjected to high pressure, the microparticles are squeezed close enough together to carry a current. One such pressurized environment is the typical battery compartment in a small device, you often have to force the battery into place. So the same battery that remains inert when swallowed works just fine when it's jammed into its slot in a hearing aid. The waterproof design would also protect batteries from corrosion in high humidity. The research is in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Tests with pigs found the coated batteries to be gentle on the porcine esophagus. Next step, figure out a way to keep kids from putting the batteries in their mouths in the first place. Can a quantum tunneling composite be made to taste terrible? It's good to keep on your toes. Metaphorically, that is. Not when you're actually out for a stroll. 
because a new study suggests that it takes nearly twice as much energy to walk on your toes than it does to land on your heel. Humans are among a small handful of animals that tend to strut heel to toe. Chimps and other apes do it, as do bears. But most critters bounce on the balls of their feet, think cats and dogs, while others trot on their toes, like horses and deer. To find out whether our gait gives us any advantages, scientists asked 27 volunteers to walk on a treadmill all three ways. Heel first, ball of the foot first, or up on tippy toes. The participants also wore face masks that enabled the researchers to measure their oxygen consumption. The results. The subjects walking on the balls of their feet, in addition to looking ridiculous, expended 50% more energy. The ones prancing on their toes needed 83% more energy. The study is in the Journal of Experimental Biology. The bottom line. Landing on our heels provides more leverage and limits energy losses to the ground. And does not look like a tribute to classic Monty Python. Parts of the planet warm and cool during El Niño and La Niña. And infectious diseases also wax and wane in step with the climate cycle. Take malaria, shown to spike in northern Venezuela during cool La Niña conditions. Or flu pandemics, which often follow months after La Niña sets in. Now researchers have linked another public health risk to El Niño climate cycling, poisonous viper bites. Their study area was Costa Rica, where health centers keep rigorous records on snake bites. They compared nine years of those snake bite records, including some 6,500 bites, to climate data over the same period. And they found that snake bites were two to three times as prevalent in the hottest and coldest years of the El Nino climate cycle. Sounds counterintuitive, right? You might expect the climate extremes to have opposite effects. But the researchers say in hot, dry years, plant productivity peaks, driving an increase in the number of rodents, aka snake food, potentially increasing the number of snakes. And snakes tend to move around more in hot, dry weather, increasing chances they'll encounter, and attack, an unlucky farmer. In cold, wet years, on the other hand, prey numbers plummet, forcing snakes to travel beyond their usual slithering grounds to eat, again increasing chances of an unlucky meeting. The study is in the journal Science Advances. The researchers also found two more variables that correlate strongly with Costa Rican's odds of being bit, poverty and destitute housing. A reminder that, when it comes to dangers from environmental disruption, it's often the least fortunate who are at the greatest risk.
scientists discover new species all the time, on the order of 15,000 a year. One of the latest additions to the tree of life is a new type of leopard frog. Which might sound unremarkable, except for where it was found, New York City. But how does a frog go unnoticed in the Big Apple? Well even experts have a hard time telling this new species from its northern and southern cousins on looks alone. But the new guy has a different croak, which raised ecologists' suspicions. So they tracked down four leopard frog populations with the unique call, including one within view of the Statue of Liberty, and took DNA samples. As they suspected, the odd croakers weren't southern or northern leopard frogs, or even a mix. They had a genetic ancestry of their own, earning them new species status. Those results appear in the journal Molecular Phylogenetics and Evolution. The frogs are tough New Yorkers, the center of their range appears to be Yankee Stadium. But the researchers say that the urban amphibians face threats like pesticides and infectious diseases. Not to mention real-life games of Frogger. What we are gonna find out today is how it's a bit more complicated than that, which it always is. I think it's really wonderful. I mean, not being an experimental scientist myself, I have a kind of envy at the way in which science can continue to surprise us by this. People working away in labs, moving on our understanding in ways. Hugo is a cognitive scientist at the French National Center for Scientific Research. Hugo Mercier